Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let me just say, today I was on one of my favorite sites. It's a great site. I recommend it. BoxingScene.com And they had an article on Canelo's failed drug test. Let's be clear here. I don't want to mix words, right? Canelo failed a drug test. Just underline the word failed. It's a failed drug test. So, of course, I'm reading the piece on the upcoming Golovkin-Canelo fight, and the biases of the author are front and center. Maybe they reflect our biases, certainly they reflect the biases of boxing media right now, right? Rather than me reading about a failed drug test in the lead up to a fight, right? Instead, I'm reading about how Canelo was found with traces, that's the word, traces of clenbuterol, serious drug, serious performance enhancing drug in a system, right? Traces. Now, I don't say this lightly. Understand, from a gambling point of view, for me, it's all about probabilities. How does Canelo getting busted, that's the word I want, busted, for the improper use of performance-enhancing drugs? How does Canelo getting off the juice of performance enhancing drugs in the lead up to a rematch of a fight that I thought he lost against Golovkin impact his chances of winning the fight. Again, for me, it's all probabilities. I'm not here. I'm a child of the 1980s. When PEDs came out and people actually started making note of them in baseball, several guys got busted. Right? That's the world I'm from. Right? Understand, in football, nobody was kidding themselves. We all knew that Tony Mandarich was juicing. Right? At least we suspected he was. Then, of course, he gets picked ahead of Deion Sanders, and, you know, people just shrugged. Right? We viewed PEDs differently back then. Right? No, for me, it comes down to probabilities. But understand, the bias right now that we have in the world toward Canelo is obvious in the press's treatment of him right now. Right, folks? Him failing a drug test is the kind of thing that really should impact the betting line. And it hasn't. Understand how major the news is of this failed drug test. I'm telling you that if Floyd Mayweather, Conor McGregor, or Manny Pacquiao failed a drug test like this. Many people in the media would be claiming that this drug use was the secret to the fighter's success. With Canelo, we shrug. We hear about tainted meat. People actually take that cover story seriously. As I said in an earlier video, understand if you've ever been around people using PEDs or um, substances that would show up in a drug test, folks openly discuss the alibi before the crime is even detected. Right? People think to themselves, okay, if my drug test comes back positive, how would I explain it? This is before they take the drug test, right? So you have the same set of excuses, right? Dietary supplement. Isn't that Dylan White's excuse? Right? In this case, it's tainted meat. Folks, you got to eat a lot of tainted meat. A lot of tainted meat to fail the two drug tests that Canelo failed. So where it impacts folks like you and me, folks who are just trying to gamble on the event and make money, 
is that understand the bias toward Canelo is so great that you have to really openly wonder if it extends to the judges. In fact, quite frankly, if you're a skeptic like I am, you don't even have to wonder about it because you saw that in the scoring of the first fight. Right now, Clem Buterol, for those who don't know, is not just a muscle builder, but it helps you cut weight. Understand, Lucas Brown at heavyweight had a better excuse than Canelo did. His argument, he actually passed a drug test right before he fought Ruslan Chagayev. Right? Then he fails one later, and he said, why would I, a heavyweight, need to cut weight? Of course, if you research the drug, you'll find out that it actually builds muscle in addition to helping you cut weight. Right? So, I get the narrative. I get the cover story. I'm not here to say, hey, the cover story is false. Okay, maybe Canelo, a world-class professional fighter with a lot of money, who presumably can afford a proper nutritional regimen. Maybe he went and got tainted meat. Maybe someone lied to him and said, hey, this meat is um, top A graded. When in fact it was tainted. It wasn't from the proper source. It was from the farmer who fed his cows clenbuterol. Okay, maybe you believe that. Right? Maybe you do. But just understand that cover story wouldn't hold for a bunch of fighters. A bunch of fighters wouldn't be looking at a big-time payday in their next fight. They'd be looking at a suspension. They'd be avoided. Right? Understand. Deontay Wilder, who I firmly believe is drug-free, right? Deontay Wilder was literally in transit to Russia when his fight against Alexander Povetkin got canceled because Povetkin tested positive for a substance that was not permitted. Right, folks? Povetkin never got the opportunity to fight Wilder. Even for Wilder's next fight, Wilder wants to fight Anthony Joshua. Right? Povetkin is in the background, isn't he? That championship opportunity never took place. Right? If Povetkin were Canelo, the fight likely would have happened because we're seeing how the sanctioning bodies are dealing with two failed drug tests for clenbuterol, the test and the retest, right before a fight for the middleweight title. Right? Let's not kid ourselves. Not everyone gets treated the same way in boxing. Your box office allure, your pull, your ability to generate dollars for sanctioning bodies and promoters is directly correlated to how you're treated in the sport. Isn't it? If you have a corporate friendly image, if you're not running a strip club like Floyd Mayweather, right, or openly cursing at press events like Conor McGregor, right, if you're not that guy, if you're a corporate guy who looks like he's a role model, even as he's failing drug tests, apparently the powers that be give you the benefit of the doubt. Let me just make a plea, though. If you're a serious journalist and you're going to comment on Canelo's positive drug tests, can you please stop trying to convince us that somehow this is an accidental result? That, oh, the guy just had traces of clenbuterol in his system. Traces, right? Understand, whoever fails a drug test usually has traces of the substance. What's the amount allowed for a DUI in the United States? In most states, isn't it 0 .08? Right? Understand, a failed test is a failed test. Right? Stop trying to spin it to make it look like this is some kind of accident. Right? If you're that biased, don't even bother. Write the piece. Let's change gears. Okay? And I don't mean to be too hard, but 
At some point, the hypocrisy just becomes too much, doesn't it? Let's say Canelo is fortunate and beats Golovkin in the rematch. And that's not my pick. I'm taking Golovkin in the rematch. But let's say Canelo wins the rematch. How comfortable are you knowing that a guy in the lead-up to a fight tested positive twice for clenbuterol and then was able to go out and fight for the championship? Right? Let me make a suggestion to boxing. When a guy tests positive for something like clenbuterol, right, winstrol, the type of stuff that's not caffeine, Right, that you know the guy had to go out and either be a complete victim of happenstance, but had to go out and look for it to get in his system. Right? Can we have a rule in boxing that even if the opponent decides to let the fight go forward, the fight's not for a title? Right. What more do you want? Him to test uh, positive for testosterone or something and we're still going to call this a title fight? I understand some people are going to lose money if it's not called a title fight. But let me just say, I don't feel comfortable here knowing that a fighter tested positive for clenbuterol, a banned substance, and yet the fight is still a title fight. That seems unfair to me, to his opponent, who is clean, hasn't tested positive. All right, let's talk about a fight that does bother me, too, right? Just from a boxing perspective, and I don't mean integrity-wise. I just mean the betting line, in my opinion, is way off. Now, I've posted a video here online of the first fight between then-champion James DeGale and his challenger, Caleb Truax. Now, what I want people to do is to just look at Truax's background. Understand, in boxing, you have some contenders who've been around, right? You have some contenders who have fought against world-class competition in the past before they were able to break through. Right, so Truax fought against a very good middleweight champion, very good middleweight champion in his day, Jermaine Taylor. He lost. He fought against another very good middleweight champion who's more current, Danny Jacobs, who, in my opinion, to this day, gave Canelo the toughest fight, not Canelo, but gave... Golovkin, the toughest fight Golovkin has had since Kasim Uma. Right? Jacobs is a damn good fighter. Understand, too, that Truax even fought Anthony Durrell. So this is a guy who, by the time he fights James DeGale, he's already been in the ring with championship-level opposition. Right? Back in my day, we call this the KG veteran. Right? You looked at guys like this and you thought, okay, they're champions, but then they're world-class contenders. Big-time litmus tests for champions. That's who Truax is. Now, I know some are going to say, wasn't he knocked out by Anthony Durrell? Great left hand. Didn't he get stopped by... Danny Jacobs, didn't he lose to Jermaine Taylor? When he steps up in class, doesn't he have problems? But let's be clear here, folks. He goes the distance with Taylor. You might recall that Taylor beat Bernard Hopkins twice. Right? Truax goes the distance with Taylor. Truax against Danny Jacobs, a guy with a punch, a guy who stopped Kid Chocolate in the first round. Truax makes it to the 12th round against Danny Jacobs. Right, so Truex is a world-class opponent. Now, James DeGale, and full disclosure, I personally consider DeGale to be one of the most talented fighters in the sport. I think DeGale is underrated. He's been one of the very best 
fighters in the sport for several years. Right from a betting perspective, the Gale's been great to me. Go back and look at my videos here where I talk about James DeGale and took him over people like Andre Durrell. Right? Lucien Boutte. Well, let me, let me just say this, though. Fighting has a human side. DeGale hurt his shoulder. DeGale was out for some time after a brutal fight against Badu Jack. Right, a champion at 175, where DeGale, right, gets knocked down in the last round. DeGale then has surgery on his shoulder, right? His fight against Truax was his first fight back from surgery, right? In many ways, DeGale right now, well, before the Truax fight, was in the same position that Keith Thurman is in right now. These are great fighters who have suffered injuries, who have had to take time off from the sport, who have you wondering how much rust the fighter has. Now, the Truax fight was a bad decision by DeGale, and what I want viewers to do is to look at how the styles match up. They don't match up well for DeGale, because Truax is like an ever-ready bunny. He's constantly hunting you down. He's constantly coming forward. Right? He takes away DeGale's ability to switch from righty to lefty. He's pressuring DeGale. He gets DeGale's back up on the ropes. He can fight smaller than DeGale. He's inside on DeGale. He's pushing the envelope. So, this isn't like the... Jamel Charlo Erickson Lubin fight, where Lubin is in the fight, gets hit with one bomb, goes down, is out. Right? So you think to yourself, okay, how convinced am I by one good punch in the fight? How would the rematch go? Right? Lubin gets hit by a punch he doesn't see. You say, okay, well, maybe that's a fluke. Folks, the first true acts, the Gale fight's not a fluke. I've put the video of that first fight in my favorites folder. What I want you to do is to fast forward to the fifth round. Folks, the Gale sustains a major beating in that round for more than two minutes of the round. Right? Truax is systematically taking apart James DeGale. Right? Truax, and I know one judge had it even. There's always that oddball judge, isn't there? But make no mistake, in DeGale's backyard, Caleb Truax took his title. Right? The fifth round's probably Truax's best. But my point to you is, look at how systematic that round is. DeGale has his back up on the ropes. Truax is coming forward. DeGale doesn't have a clue on how to defend himself against Caleb Truax. The rematch isn't going to be in DeGale's backyard. The rematch is going to be in Las Vegas. So you can imagine my surprise to learn that Caleb Truax... A vet, this is almost like the military, a vet who had tours of duty against Jermaine Taylor, Danny Jacobs, Anthony Durrell, right? Caleb Truax, who wins the first fight against James DeGale. Can we agree at a minimum? He goes 12 rounds against James DeGale, right? Travels to DeGale's backyard for that fight. Somehow the odds makers have Caleb Truax as a five to one underdog. Five to one. As I like to say, no need to put a bow on the package. Sign me up. I'll be the casino's Huckleberry. I'll be the guy taking the winner of the first fight, 
getting five to one odds. Look. Oh, let me just hedge the play too here. I view the Anthony Durrell fight as an outlier. Right, Durrell does get off a hell of a right hand to end that fight. It's the second time that Caleb Truax hits the canvas. Right? First round KO. Great. The Caleb Truax, who I think is going to show up for this fight, is the same one who showed up for the first fight. The same one who's already seen the Gale for 12 rounds. Right? The true axe I'm expecting to show up is the one who went the distance with Jermaine Taylor. The one who makes it into the 12th round against Danny Jacobs. The hedge I like is the over in this fight. Whatever they post the over as, that's what I want as the hedge. So, I'm going to take the 5 to 1 odds on the winner of the first fight, Caleb Truax, to win this fight. I don't care if he does it by KO. I don't care if he does it by decision. Right? I don't even care if he wins by disqualification. The key word there is win. Right? He wins, I win. I'm going to take Caleb Truax here 5-1 to one to win the fight, hedged with the over. Why? Because if Truax systematically takes apart James DeGale, who hasn't had a fight since their first fight, which was the Gale's first fight in several months. Right? If the Gale gets undressed again, I want to win both sides of the play. If Truax wins again by decision, I want to collect on the Truax simply to win side, and I want to collect on the over. Let me also say, too, that the Gale, lately, hasn't been taking guys out early. Right? That Badu Jack fight is in the 12th round, right? It goes the distance. Lucien Boutte goes the distance against him. Andre Durrell goes the distance against James DeGale. Right? I don't see DeGale knocking out Truax early. So the bet I'm recommending in this fight, and again, I encourage you to look at the fifth round. I have the tape up in my favorites folder of DeGale against Truax. The bet I'm recommending is Caleb Truax to successfully defend his title at 5-1 to one odds, hedged with the over in the rematch of Truax against James DeGale. Let me also add, too, that sometimes I'm out and people will come up to me and they'll say, hey, are you really taking the underdog in this upcoming fight? And I almost want to say to them, would you rather me take the favorite at ridiculous odds that favor the casino? Why would I want to do that, folks? Boxing's competitive. Styles make fights. This is that rare occasion where I look at the Gale and I say, hey, the Gale against most guys wins. I personally consider the Gale to be one of the best in boxing pound for pound. But let's remember, styles make fights to such an extent that Kirkland Lang once beat Roberto Duran. Oran Barkley beat Thomas the Hitman Hearns twice. Sometimes people just have the key to your lock. Right? This style matchup isn't a good one for James DeGale. We've already seen 12 rounds of action between these two guys. And yes, the odds matter. If this fight were priced differently, I'd say, you know what, I'm going to sit on the sidelines, just as I did the first time, right? There's no pre-fight video of me before the first fight between Truax and DeGale, because I thought DeGale's coming off surgery. Is the James DeGale that shows up going to be prime James DeGale, right? And the answer was no. I didn't bet on the first fight. If these odds were different, I'd say, you know what, this is a problematical 
matchup. I'm going to stay on the sidelines. But the minute the casino says 5-1, to one, Caleb Truax is the underdog. And you can see the odds at oddschecker.com. That's when I've got to say, wow, somebody's deluded on this fight. I mean, Truax won in the UK. How certain am I that Truax, a professional, a guy who's been in the ring against, you know, think about it. He's already been in the ring. Taylor, Jacobs, and DeGale. He's already been in the ring with all three guys. You're telling me that I'm getting five to one odds on Truax against an opponent he's already beaten by decision on the road? Wrap it up. I'll take it. I like Truax to win the fight hedged with the over. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. Go ahead and give us a different point of view. Tell us why we should be rolling with the favorite in this fight. Why you're certain that a guy coming off of shoulder surgery who hasn't had a win since he went in the shoulder surgery is going to rejuvenate his career and is going to win this fight. Let me close, too, by saying, look, you know, people need to understand how isolated these fighters are, right? The people around the fighter have to give consideration to the fighter's ego, right? A lot of these fighters don't have no men around them. There's no one to say, hey, player, look, I know you're a great fighter. But you lost by a few rounds to this guy the first time, and you're coming off surgery. Maybe we need to take a couple of fights against guys who haven't beaten you to get back your confidence. Right? Wouldn't it have been silly of the Gale to take a fight against George Groves right here, another guy who beat him? Why isn't it silly? For DeGale to be taking this fight right now. Right? What's the rush? DeGale's in his early 30s. Couldn't DeGale have said, hey, I need to work some things through? Instead, he's going to fight a guy who systematically beat him up. You don't believe me? Just look at the three minutes of the, third, of the, excuse me, of the fifth round. Folks, that's a systematic beating. Systematic. Not a one-punch KO. The fighter can't say, I got hit with a lucky punch. What's the Gale going to say? You know, I got hit with more than 100 lucky punches. It doesn't work. Right? The Gale, I'm sure, runs his camp. I'm sure he's a fighter, he's a warrior, and he wants to avenge his loss. What he should be doing is thinking about his long-term career. He should be thinking about slowly getting back in the groove on his shoulder. Everyone and their cornerman wants to fight Keith Thurman right now at room 47. Right? If Thurman wants to fight against Danny Garcia, who he beat before, Sean Porter, who he beat before, both of those guys want to fight him. Errol Spence would love the opportunity, love the opportunity to fight Keith Thurman. Keith Thurman is wise enough to realize that at this stage of his career, right after his own shoulder surgery, he might not be prime Keith Thurman. He might need to get back in the saddle and ride the horse a bit before he goes to the rodeo. Right? So Keith Thurman's not rushing into fights against guys he's beaten. Here, James DeGale is rushing into a rematch against a fighter who's beaten him. And the casino is giving you five to one. <laughs> five to one on the rematch, which is happening in Las Vegas. I think the Gale is making a mistake here. You know how I'm playing this. Let me hear how you're playing this and why in the comment section to this video. Thanks for stopping by. I look forward to your comments.